بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته مرحبا مرحبا Welcome everyone to our first class of our Lamia Ibn Taymiyyah course with our dear instructor Yusha Abu Zakaria Hafizahullah Ta'ala we'd like to thank Allah Azza wa Jalla for allowing us to gather for his sake and depart for his sake. And after that, we'd like to thank our wonderful attendees, our brothers and sisters from all across the globe who have sacrificed their time in order to learn about the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how to worship him in the correct manner. And finally, we'd like to thank our ustad, our guest lecturer, Al Ustad Yusha Abu Zakaria, who is a good friend of mine, someone who I've known for years, even before coming to the Mamlika. Brother, mashallah, tabarakallah, who I love for the sake of Allah, and I've benefited from tremendously. May Allah bless him and accept from him and put barakah in his knowledge and his time. I mean, before we begin with the lecture, I'd like to remind everyone that this course is about four to five weeks. We have prizes for the students who memorize the entire poem okay so every week you can memorize three lines so you see here the poem in the flyer all right we'll send the poem in text format in photo format and every week you should memorize three lines and then we'll have a bot on telegram where you can send in your submissions audibly okay and we'll check it at the end of the course inshallah ta'ala we'll have an exam to test your memorization, you recite from the beginning to the end or, you know, different places. And those who pass the exam, they will receive a gift, inshallah ta'ala, from keys to knowledge. We ask Allah to accept these efforts and to make it a proof for us on the Day of Judgment. نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه ثم أما بعد so as preceded uh, by our dear brother عبد السلام then we will be reviewing and commenting on what is known as Alamiyyah to Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. And this Alamiyyah is referred to as Alamiyyah, as a, as a poem, right? And it's called Alamiyyah because the end of every bait ends with the, the harf lam, with the letter lam. Okay, for example, Ya Sa'ili an madhabi wa aqidati, that's a half of a bait, and then the rest, Ruzik al-Huda man lil hidayati yas'alu. So it ends with the letter lam. And for this, it is called the Lamiya. Now, this Lamiya is attributed to Sheikh, none other than Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyad. And it is reported that it was found from, from amongst his books, from amongst his works, irregardless of the fact that his students did not mention this poem. They, they didn't mention this. As they mentioned other of his works, they didn't mention this poem. So some scholars, they... They don't have 100% yaqeen or, or certainty that this poem can be attributed to Sheikh al-Islam. However, the, you know, the majority see that this poem can authentically be attributed to, the, to Sheikh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah. And before we begin, we give a brief, a very brief, inshallah, muqaddima about who the Sheikh is, as I'm sure everyone has heard of him before, and most of us know who he is. Then he is Abu al-Abbas. That's his kunya. Abu al-Abbas Ahmed, the son of Abdul Halim, the son of Abdul Salam ibn Taymiyyah. Al-Harrani, as he is attributed to the city of Harran in Sham, which is now Syria. He was born in the year 661, Hijri, and he died 728. And to give perspective, that's the year, give or take, the year 1263, uh, Gregorian, uh, and he died in the year 1328. Okay. Now he comes from a lineage of scholarly uh, of, of scholarship. His father was a scholar, and his grandfather was a scholar. In fact, they were huge scholars. 
and they were considered the scholars of their town. They were returned to in, in every field, in every science. In fact, his grandfather, Abdul um, Salam, he is considered from the greatest scholars of the Hanbali Madhab. And, and each of them, including Sheikh al-Islam, have written and expounded in every science in Islam. It is, hard, it is very rare that you find a science except that he has either a risala, a short uh, essay, or a book, a lengthy book. So mashallah, Allah has blessed that family with knowledge. And we ask Allah to bless us and our offspring with knowledge as well. Um, in regards to what the Sheikh was known for, specifically he was, he was known for his akhlaq, his mannerisms. He was very humble, very kind, very giving. And specifically, he was known for, other than his knowledge, he was known for his worship. He used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he was an abid and an alim. And the best are those who join between the two. They not only worship Allah, every single second you see them worshiping Allah, either making dhikr or doing outwardly acts of worship that you can see like salah and zakat. Uh, and he, he, got, he joined that with knowledge. He was an extremely knowledgeable man. Rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy, have mercy upon him. Another thing that, that is important to know about Shaykh al-Islam is that he defended Islam with his pen and his tongue and his sword. He was a complete pa uh, package, mashallah. Allah yarhamu. So he wrote and spoke out and taught the correct understanding in accordance to the the, the, the Quran and Sunnah in accordance to the understanding of the, the Sahaba and the righteous uh, Salaf that they taught and they taught and so on and so forth. And he also fought to defend uh, his, 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 his dawla, the country that he lived in, Sham, when the Mongols came to invade. So he wasn't someone of, of speech, rather he was someone of speech and action, acting upon his knowledge and acting upon jihad. So he, he really was a defender of Islam. In every, in every facet. And so much so that, of course, anybody that fights for the sake of Islam, then he will have opposition, just as the, uh, the, the prophets and the messengers. They had opposition, and so will those who fight for the sake of Islam in our time. In fact, the Shaykh al-Islam is recorded that he was in prison seven times, and each time for different lengths. And just to, to end it briefly, his last experience being imprisoned was... Um, for two years and he was in prison for explaining and clarifying the correct position of visiting the graves yani what, what, do, what, do Ahlul Sunnah do, what does Ahlul Sunnah do when we visit the graves and how to appropriately uh, visit the graves in accordance with the Sunnah and he refuted that which uh, Ahlul Sufiya were upon And so alhamdulillah, he was imprisoned at that point for two years and he passed away and, and that was his last time in prison. Rahimahullah. So inshallah, that will suffice and we'll move on to the muqaddimah of the course itself. Now, as we know, the poem itself is a poem in regards to aqidah, right? It's a concise poem that will touch on some of the many topics that are covered within the science of aqidah. So before we delve into that, then it's important that we understand what exactly is aqidah, okay? And it stems from the, the letter, the word aqd, okay? Which in Arabic, it stems from three letters, ayn, qaf, and dal, okay? Now in Arabic, aqd has many different meanings. And from them, from amongst them, are aqd al-habl, to tie a knot or to tie a rope tightly, to strengthen it, to, 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 make, the tight very, uh, to make the knot very tight as well as to make a contract or to make an agreement or to make an obligation between you and another party. As for, uh, and that's gathered in the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu awfu bil uqood, yani al uhud. And uh, also, aqtu uh, nikah yani a marriage agreement, a marriage contract. As well, as lastly, it is something that the heart is sure of, that the heart wraps around, that the heart, the heart is firm upon, without doubt. So that is in regards to the linguistic definition of aqt, okay? Now, in regards to the technical use of the word, or in regards to Islam, then al-aqidah is a firm and absolute faith and conviction without any doubt 
in matters regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that encompasses all types of uh, tawheed, uh, uh, the three types of tawheed, tawheed al-uluhiyya, rububiyya, wal asma wa sifat, in matters to, in, in matters regarding the prophets and the messengers, affairs of all afterlife, and other than that, from which has been made obligatory upon the Muslims to believe in. So that encompasses all of the actions or all of the matters of the ghayb, the jinn, wal malaika. And all of this is covered in the ayah. In, uh, okay. the, the technical definition is, and this is gathered from three or four definitions, because some can be lengthy and some can be very brief. And so al-aqidah is a firm or the firm and absolute faith and conviction without any doubt in matters regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we say in, in matters regarding Allah, then we are referring to all of the types of uh, tawheed, al-thalatha, the three types of tawheed, al-uluhiyya, al-rububiyya, al-asma'u uh, sifat. Yani the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the actions that belong solely to Allah, and then the actions from the slaves that only Allah deserves, our worship, and then how we believe in regards to the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as well as his prophets, his messengers, the affairs of the afterlife, meaning from death and onwards, yawm al qiyamah, the, re the resurrection, jannah, nar, and other than that, from which has been made obligatory for the Muslims to believe in, in regards to the matters of the ghayb. And to help us, um, yes, the six pillars of Islam are, are contained within that. And it's gathered in the ayah at the end of Surah Al-Baqarah. And then Allah mentions those uh, from the six pillars of Iman. But the key point here is ma unzila ilayhi. Everything that Allah revealed to the messenger, we believe in. And we hold that firm without a doubt. And to help us understand in a simpler matter, then Islam can be divided into two categories. The first being al-aqidah and the second being a sharia ah. Okay, and al-aqidah is in regards to what we mentioned as our belief. And a sharia ah is in regards to our ibadah and our mu'amala, our, our physical actions. Salah and zakah and the hukm and the ahkam and the rulings in regards to those. And now that we understand al-aqidah is something general and wide and, uh, and vast in its topic, then I want to address a, a common misconception when it comes to when we hear the word aqidah, okay? And that is that aqidah has many different names or is referred to as many different things, all right? And from those titles and from those names are at tawheed, okay? Now that might strike someone as confusing. How can we, how can we call aqidah, which is in regards to all of the matters of the qaib, and then we call it at tawheed, which is in regards to isolating Allah and worship. Well, the scholars mentioned that this is from, this is a part of the language in which you name something in regards to the most honorable part of it. So the most honorable and most important part of Al-Aqidah is our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So scholars of past have, have called or referred to Al-Aqidah as at tawheed But it should not be mistaken that Al-Aqidah is isolated or is, is, is just at tawheed Rather, it is Tawheed and more. And of the importance of Tawheed, I mean Al-Aqidah, without a doubt, uh, the most important is that there is no Islam without Al-Aqidah. If a person's Aqidah is incorrect, or they reject one of the facets of aqidah, one of the topic matters. For example, they reject the jinn or they reject the malaika or they reject the kutub and the rusul, one or the other, one of the many. Then their Islam is battled. Their Islam is null and void. Aqidah is accepted as a package. We have to believe in it wholly. We cannot pick and choose. And so a person's aqidah, if it is sound and he is firm upon it, then his Islam is accepted and his actions as for what follows is accepted. And if a person is to have the firm and correct belief in his aqidah, then it should, without a doubt, have an effect in his actions. And it will give a person that that, that 
tranquility in his life. That his ideology and his mind and his heart is wrapped around sound beliefs, something that he has no doubt in. And you find the opposite, that those that, that do not have the correct aqidah, they do not know what they believe in, they are with, with doubt, and they're moving from topic to topic, and then they never have certainty, then they will never have that tranquility. Okay, so after the, the muqaddimah, hopefully that was clear. Then we can move straight on into the poem itself. Okay, the first bait being, Ya sa'ili an madhabi wa aqidati, ruzq al-huda man lil-hidayati yas'al. Ya sa'ili. So, Sheikh al-Islam, he writes, O questioner, O the one that has questioned me, an madhabi wa aqidati. Someone has asked him. So we understand from this that the poem was written in a response to a question. And the question being, what is your aqidah? What, you, what do you believe in? And what is your madhab in regards to your aqidah? How do you go about understanding what is it that you have to believe in and what is it that you have to disbelieve in? And very, from the very beginning, we understand here that a question sparked this entire poem. And we can see the importance of asking questions and the benefits of asking questions. In that, from the reasons why books or poems or essays in Aqidah were ever written or were ever penned down and preserved, from amongst them are questions that were asked to people of knowledge. Because whenever we are in doubt, whenever we don't know, we should return to those who have knowledge. And it is from that that we get the answer and that we receive that, 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 that guidance that we seek. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ So it is an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if we don't know, that we return to those who do know. And from the most beneficial questions that we can see the, the impact of it in our daily life, is Hadith Jibreel. And, and there's honestly layers to this, in that the Hadith itself, which is narrated by, in, in the first, it's the first Hadith in the Sahih Muslim, okay? And the story behind it is something that many don't know, but the Hadith many are aware of. The Hadith, that which in it, within it, contains all of Islam. Right, and the story behind it is that two companions from Basra, which is a city in Iraq right now, right, they they heard someone in their region discussing Qadr, discussing the divine de the decree of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and they didn't believe in it. They said there is no defined, there, there is no decree, uh, and and that we are being forced. We don't have a say. So they went to Mecca, or they went to Medina or Mecca. Uh, in order to make Hajj or Umrah. And they said to each other, if we bump into one of the companions of the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam, then we have to ask him. We have to ask him, we have to find out exactly what is the correct understanding and what is the correct position that we should hold in regards to this divine decree. So, Alhamdulillah, they bumped into Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And he was exiting the masjid. And so they accompanied him, one on each of his shoulders. They circled him. And they were walking with him. And they asked him, they said, Ya Aba, uh, ya Aba Abdul Rahman, O oh, the father of Abdul Rahman, there are people in our town that they say this about Qadr. They say that there is no Qadr. Right? That we have no say, that we've been forced. And so Abdul uh, Abdullah ibn Umar, he says to them, tell them that I am free from them and they are free from me. And that no matter how much they spend in the sake of Allah, that he will not accept anything until they believe in Qadr. And then he narrated to them the hadith. The hadith that is known as Hadith Jibreel. So without that question, perhaps the hadith would not have reached us. And from that question, that noble and important hadith was narrated to us. 
and a layer below that, that hadith itself is based around questions. So here we see the importance of asking questions in seek of guidance. And now when it comes to asking questions, then it's important that we know there are praiseworthy questions and there are non-praiseworthy questions. And in regards to praiseworthy questions, then they are for those who are truthfully and sincerely seeking an answer. Or those who want to ask questions so that others around them can benefit, as Jibreel did when he came to the Prophet ﷺ. Now, these are two questions that are praiseworthy, or two types of questions, or two types of manners in asking questions that are praiseworthy. In regards to the opposite, non-praiseworthy questions are asking questions to show off, or asking questions to stump the questioner, to make it clear that he doesn't know something, or to try to make it apparent to others that you know more than him. There's a questions that are not praiseworthy. And so he says, Ya sa'ili an madhabi wa aqidati. So madhab here, as far as when it comes to sharia, then we understand madhab to mean um, the schools of thought of the famous, of the, the four uh, great imams, Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Abu ha um, Imam Ahmed, and Imam Shafi. But in regards to this poem, then Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah is referring to the madhab in which, the, the path in which he treads upon in regards to the Quran and Sunnah so that he may understand what is his aqidah. So madhab here refers to the kayfiyya. How exactly does he understand or how does exactly does he deduct evidence from the Quran and Sunnah in regards to his aqidah? And in regards to Shaykh al-Islam, then it's to be known that his madhab and his aqidah is the Qur'an and the Sunnah, right? It's tawqifi. It's tawqifi. Whereas the affairs in aqidah don't leave or don't exit the, the circle of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And that is the madhab of the Salaf. And that is the madhab of the, of the Sahaba. And when it comes to the word aqidati, and he attributes it to himself, then it is not to be understood that this is aqidah specific for Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. And rather, he is attributing this aqidah as, as to himself to refer that this is what I believe in. This is the aqidah that I believe in. In opposition to Ahl al-Bid'ah al dalal the people of, diff, of the, the deviant sex, their aqidah is attributed to certain people because they are the foundation of this aqidah. They are the foundation of this belief system. Whereas Ahl sunnah our foundation and our asl returns back to the Quran, Quran and sunnah and the understanding of the, of the, of the sahaba. So after addressing the questioner, he makes dua for the question. He says, That may the one who is seeking guidance, may he be provided, may he be enriched with guidance. And he makes dua for him with the best of which is to be asked for. As we repeat in Al-Fatiha 17 times a day, Al-Aqal. The first dua that Allah teaches us to, to, to recite in the Quran is that we ask him for guidance. And it is important to know that al-hidayah or guidance is of types. It is not just one guidance, right? And we'll discuss four specific types of guidance. The first being general guidance. Guidance that everyone is included within. And that can be understood from the ayah the one that gave every single creation or every single thing its shape and its form, and then he guided. Meaning he guided and he inspired each creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired each creation 
to know exactly what they have to do in life. That which will benefit them in this life, they know. For example, a baby, when it comes out of the womb, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides that baby to know that he has to suckle, that he has to breastfeed. There's no one telling the baby. The baby comes out of the womb and immediately already knows when it comes near to the mother that it's time to suckle and he knows how to feed. This is the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's for everybody. This same guidance is in regards to animals. And it's in regards to every single creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he guides it to that which is in its masalih, that which is in its benefit. That's the first level of guidance. The second level of guidance is الدلال والإرشاد والبيان and that is direction or making or, or clarification based upon knowledge to the correct way. Knowledge or clarification or direction that will lead you to the correct way. However, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't guarantee that a person will act upon that knowledge. Rather, it is just showing a person the knowledge. And this can be understood from the ayah in Mecca that Allah says to the Prophet والسلام, that indeed you call towards the straight path. Indeed you guide towards it. And he also says, And as for Thamud, then we guided them. But they preferred blindness instead of guidance. Or they preferred kufr, disbelief, instead of iman. They rejected the guidance, but we guided them. Meaning we showed them and we made clear to them the correct way. However, and this leads us to the third type of guidance, which is a tawfiq. A tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when Allah guides a person, he grants them that tawfiq, to, that success and that ability to act upon that knowledge. And this type of knowledge is only, or this type of guidance is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is to be understood from the ayah, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتِ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِالْمُهْتَدِينَ That indeed you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you do not, you are not able to guide, you are not able to give the ability to accept and act upon that knowledge, whomever you choose or whomever you love. That rather, that ability or that action is only to be attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That only Allah guides by giving us the, the, the ability and the success to act upon that knowledge. And the last type of, uh, of guidance is the guidance in the afterlife. The guidance al-huda or al-hidayah towards jannah or nar or the hellfire. And this is to be understood from the ayah in which Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ يَهْدِيهِمْ رَبُّهُمْ بِإِيمَانِهِمْ يعني That Allah will guide those who believe, those who believe and did righteous deeds, He will guide them in accordance their, to their iman towards Jannah. And some of the Salaf said that He will guide them with a nur, with a light. On the Sirat, on the Day of Judgment, when they are walking over Jahannam, Allah will guide them towards Jannah. And in opposite, in opposition to that, Allah also says, "Fahduhum ila siratil jahin." Guide them, the people who worship other than Him, will guide them towards the hellfire. So we took four types of hidayah. The first one being general, a general guidance in which Allah gives to everybody. Everyone is mushtarik fi. Everyone receives this guidance. This is the guidance in which Allah directs or inspires his creation to do that which is beneficial towards them, that which they need to do to, in order to survive, like breathing, like babies suckling when they come out the womb. Certain animals, when they're born, they have to know certain things. Elef elephants, they have to walk as soon as they're born or else they will not survive. This is, an, this is a, a guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kafir, mu'min, everybody is, in, is entitled to this guidance. And in regards to the second guidance, then it's uh, right? It's when Allah guides and directs a person to knowing the correct way. 
so that they can differentiate between right and wrong in return in, in return in in regards to his guidance. And we said that this is also anyone can do this. And you can display Islam to anybody. You can explain to them the clarity of Al-Islam and the clarity of Al-Tawheed. And Allah gave this right to us and he gave it to the Prophet ﷺ when he said, That you guide towards the right path, you call towards it. You show people exactly which is the right path to follow. But it stops there. And the third type of guidance is a tawfiq min Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is that ability and success from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah grants you the ability to act upon that knowledge, to accept Islam, to do those deeds once you know about it. To stay away from those sins once you know that it's haram. This type of guidance is what we ask for when we say, Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. We ask for both. That Allah show us the correct way and grant us the ability to. Because unfortunately, we find some people, they say, well, I can't, I, I just can't stop. Or I, I know that Islam is the truth, but I just can't accept it. They have been prevented from that, that second, that latter part of the, of the guidance, and which is the most important part. And then the last portion of guidance is a guidance in the afterlife, in which Allah will guide Ahlul Jannah ila Jannah wa Ahlul Nar ila Nar. He will guide the, the, the inhabitants of Jannah towards Jannah, and he will guide, or the, the people of Hellfire will be guided to the Hellfire. So here, Ruzi al Hudam and Hidaj Kiyas Elu, the person that's asking, right? He's asking for this beneficial knowledge. He's asking for what is the correct aqidah? What is the correct way to understand the Quran and Sunnah so that my deen can be saved? Then this person, he's making dua for him that he is granted this guidance. He is granted the guidance of knowledge, knowing the correct way. And bi'idhnillah, he's granted the ability and success to act upon that, to believe in it, to hold firm upon it. Because as we know, there's no knowledge except that it calls upon action. So it is not enough for someone to just know what we believe as Muslims. But he has to have that firm conviction in his heart or her heart that this is what I believe. And he negates what is in opposition to that. And it will in turn have an effect on his actions or her actions. And from this, and, and before we, we finish the debate, then we, we, we want to, he uses a specific verb, right? He says, ruzik. He uses the word, the verb, razaqa, to be provided as a provision, as if it's some type of, um, it's something you're given, okay? And we understand from the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he is ar razaq that to Allah alone is ar razaq He is the one that provides. And so provision here, in regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is of two types. Again, you have a general and a specific. You have the, rizq, the provision that Allah gives to, his, to, to all of his creation. He provides us all with an ability to live, and he provides us all with food and drink, and we, we're all able to gain money, we're all able to... Um, to a certain extent, everyone's able to live and uh, provide for themselves and earn a living. This is a provision from everybody. Everyone has the provision. Allah provides us with knowledge. He provides us with health. This is general. Everyone gets this. Believer and disbeliever. And then there's a second level of that provision. A provision for those who are closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the believers. And that is when Allah provides them with iman. And he provides them with guidance. These are provisions that are specific. And these are provisions that are only for those that Allah, that Allah chooses. And we also gain from this bait, we also learn from this bait, this line of poetry, that when we seek knowledge or when we seek to understand something, we should be seeking how to, un how to act upon that. That we shouldn't just be seeking it to have it, to store it with us. To say, I know that. Yeah, I read that before. I studied that before. That's not enough. Rather, we have to seek and we have to ask and we have to learn in order that we may act upon it. So it may change us. It may have an effect upon us. And we may gain the desired effect from it. And lastly, 
just as gaining a provision or gaining our provisions in our daily life requires a type of juhd, requires a type of, of uh, exertion from us, right? Someone can't just expect to sit down and receive the food that he needs for the day, uh, receive the money he needs for rent, for clothes, to provide for his family. Rather, a person has to put some type of effort in. Likewise, knowledge. A person has to put in some type of effort. And we get that from here. This, uh, that he's making dua for the person that has put forth the effort to ask those whom he needs to ask so that he may know. He put forth the effort, however it be small or large, that is how the guidance is given. And that's how Allah gives guidance. And that's how Allah opens doors for people. When we put that juhd for it, when we put that exertion for it, and we sacrifice, either by asking a question, or traveling far, or sacrificing time and energy, it is expected from those that do such actions or sacrifice sacrifices that Allah will gain will give them guidance and will provide that for them. And examples of that in the Quran are many, and from them is when uh, Maryam was ordered to shake the tree so that the dates may fall for her. She was ordered, even in her situation of extreme hardship, she's giving birth by herself. She was ordered to still put forth that effort, still put forth that juhd, exert yourself, and the, and, the, and the reward will come for you. The provision of Allah will come for you. And likewise, Musa. That Allah ordered Musa to strike with his, his staff the ocean so that it may split. And if Allah wills, he could, have, he could have split the ocean without that, without the effort of Musa. But he still wanted Musa to have that connection, to have that, that exertion towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's also found in the ayah, وَالَّذِينَ اهْتَدَوْا زَادَهُمْ هُدَىٰ that those who follow the guidance, those who are guided, we increase them in guidance and we give them their provision of taqwa. So moving to the, the second bait. Isma' kalama muhaqqifin fi qawlihi la yanthani anhu wa la yatabaddalu. So after Sheikh al-Islam, he addresses the questioner and he, he addresses the topic in which he's about to uh, write about. And then he makes dua for the questioner in regards to them asking questions and them seeking that correct knowledge. Then he informs them, Isma, then listen up, pay attention, draw near. And he's doing this so that he gathers the person's attention. Then listen to what a muhaqqiq is putting forth. Listen to the speech of a muhaqqiq, right? So a fact checker, someone that is doing tahqiq, someone that is verifying the information. And a muhaqqiq is not like the muhaqqiq that we know now or that has become famous now in, in regards to what Sheikh Islam is referring to. It's not someone who is going back to different matbu'at uh, or different copies of books and making sure that the text is correct and he's, he's cross-checking his um, to, to print out a book. Rather, a muhaqqiq here is an alim, is a scholar that when he speaks or when he um, writes, everything he's saying it has been crossed and checked, has been verified with the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Meaning, isma' kalama muhaqqiqin you have very, listen, for you have verily found, you have verily asked a person who what he's saying is verified. Yeah, what I'm saying to you right now, what I'm going to tell you about aqidati wa madhabi is verified. There's no doubt what I'm going to tell you. And know that it's coming from a scholar. Some, it's coming from someone who has crossed the T's and dotted the I's. And it's similar to the saying of Yusuf, ij'alni ala khaza'in al-ard, inni hafidun alim. Yani is praising yourself to an extent so that the person feels a surety with you. Yusuf said, so put me in charge of the khazain of the, of the, the, the president. Uh, put me in charge of the khazain of the earth that I am indeed hafidun. 
Alim, I'm, I'm, I, I'm knowing, I know exactly what to do, and I will preserve your stuff. I'm trustworthy in this action. Put me in charge of it. And so Shaykh al-Islam is, is, is telling the, the questioner, and in turn, us, the reader, that he, rahimahullah, what he's about to tell you is verified. There's no doubt about it. You can go back to the Quran, you can go back to the, the, the Sunnah of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, and you will find what he's speaking about. لا ينتني عنه ولا يتبدل لا ينتني عنه ولا يتبدل that this محقق and this عقيدة and this مذهب لا ينتني عنه that he doesn't go back from it he doesn't turn back from it meaning what I'm about to tell you in regards to my عقيدة and my مذهب and how we should believe in our عقيدة and our مذهب is that once it is affirmed that what we are saying and what we are believing in is from the Quran and Sunnah and it's fabid, then we don't go back and we don't search for anything other than it. We are firm in our understanding and our footing in regards to these topics and these subjects. We are not flip-flopping, going back and forth. And this is an opposition to Ahlul Bid'a with Dalal in regards to the people of, of misguidance and Bid'a and innovation. Allah speaks about them, in whom illa yakhrusun, they're only lying. They're only debating. They're just going back and forth. They're known as Ahlul Tanakul. They have no firmness. Their understanding goes back and forth. They waver. Whereas Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, when we seek to understand our Aqidah, then we seek for firmness. We seek steadfastness. That which we can stand upon. As Allah says, Qul hadihi sabili. I call, I, call, I call towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon certainty. I have no doubt in what I'm calling to. And just as our aqidah is based upon steadfastness, then likewise, having this correct aqidah and believing in Allah and his messengers and his malaika and his, and his angels and, his, and the jinn and all of the matters of the ghaib and the jannah and the nar and the, and the hereafter, believing in them firmly and correctly, they lead to a person having uprightness and steadfastness. Just as his understanding is steadfast and firm, then his feet and his heart and his life will be steadfast and upright. So inshallah, that, that is what we that is what been, has been made easy for us in regards to the muqaddimah of the poem. And inshallah, next week we will cover more ground and we will get into the deeper topics of the poem. <laughs> Jazakumullah khaira. May Allah Azza wa Jalla accept on your behalf. Alhamdulillah, it was a very beneficial lecture. If anyone has any questions, you can ask in the chat and then Ustaz will answer, inshallah. Another thing, everyone's been asking about this PDF, uh, inshallah, this Word document. We're, we're still working on it, as you can see. Um, we have the poem in the beginning. And then we have by each uh, line, okay? We have to add the English here to make it easy for everyone. Here, you'll be able to write your benefits, okay? And over here, we decided to help you all in memorizing. So we decided to put, you know, boxes here where you could trace it and then you could write it on your own because writing assists with memorization, okay? So we're going to do that for the rest of the poem and inshallah, it'll be ready in a couple of days, okay? And we'll send it to the group. We'll send it to the channel on Telegram. Uh, just to repeat for those who came late, there'll be prizes for those who memorize this poem at the end of the course. Um, everyone is asked, you know, memorize to the best of the ability, at least three lines per week to memorize at least three lines per week. And then there will be a bot on Telegram where you'll be able to send your recital.
and you'll be corrected, you'll be heard, and you'll be corrected, inshallah. All right, and at the end of the course, we have one exam, um, yani, and you will recite the whole poem. And if you pass, you'll get a, you'll get a prize, okay? Naam. So any questions, inshallah ta'ala, we can ask now. You can ask right now. Uh, it's it, it's not mentioned in a specific book. Rather, it was found in in any amongst his his works. Someone asked, "What is the importance of this poem?" Uh, the importance of this poem, as we said in the beginning, that this is a poem in regards to our aqidah, our belief. Okay, and that. There is no Islam without Aqidah. This is what the messengers were sent with. So it is important that a person or a Muslim specifically knows exactly what he believes in. How does he believe in Allah? How does he, what does his heart believe in about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And what does he negate? What does he believe in regards to the afterlife? What does he, these are the questions that we ask, we have to ask ourselves every single day. And these are the questions, the same questions that bother the disbelievers because they have uncertainty towards them. So we have to take it, take advantage of the opportunity. Allah has blessed us with Islam. Okay, I'm Muslim. What does that mean? What does that entail? What do I believe? Because it is my belief system that will enter me into Jannah. It is my belief system that will make Allah pleased with me. It is my belief system that separates me from, from, from everyone else. So then who am I and what do I believe in as a Muslim? Uh, what did the Ustav mention about the use of madhab in the poem? What is the meaning of madhab in the poem? Then when it comes to the word madhab, then we, like we, we said, then in regard, uh, generally speaking, when it comes to madhab, what we, what is, what has become famous is that we are, is that is, is what is regard, in regards to fiqh, in regards to ahkam, then that is a school of thought. But in regards to this poem, and in regards to the, the asal or the origin of the word madhab, then it is a way in which you, you, or the way in which you move. Okay, so the madhab here is a way in which you derive or deduct your aqidah. Okay, so for example, the madhab of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the madhab, our madhab in regards to our aqidah is Quran and Sunnah, is tawqifi. We return to the Quran and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the Sahaba and the Salaf. Okay? That's our method. That's our tariqah. That's, our, that's the way in which we tread. Now, to help us understand that, we look at in opposition to that. For example, Ahlul Kalam or the people of philosophy, like the Mu'tazila or Asha'ira, then they, they return back to the Quran and Sunnah, but they also bring aql. They also bring their intellect into the, the, the affair. Okay? And they sometimes prefer intellect or they raise the intellect over the nas, over uh, an ayah from the Quran or a hadith from the Prophet alayhi salatu So we would say this is not our madhab. This is not the madhab of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. This is not the way in which Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah address or deduct our aqidah. Uh, can you repeat about the three types of Tawheed? Okay, then the three types of Tawheed are uh, Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah. Okay, Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah. And this is in regards to the actions of the slave in which we give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The actions of the slave in which we isolate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, we pray only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We make dua only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We fast for Allah's sake. All of, the, all of this is in is it encompasses a tawhid al uluhiyyah that what we get, what the servant gives to Allah subhanahu wa taala afal al abd so the, the actions of the slave and the second category is a tawhid al rububiyyah okay al rububiyyah translates to lordship and it refers to the actions of Allah subhanahu wa taala that we we isolate him with. Meaning Allah is Al-Khaliq, He is the Creator, He is Al-Malik, He is the Owner, He is Al-Mudabbir. Yani he, he is the one that 
sets all of the affairs in order. He is in control of everything. He is the one that provides for his creation. These are actions and, and attributes that we attribute only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he has no partner in these actions. And lastly, al-asma wa sifat. Then these are the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These names and attributes that Allah and his messenger affirm for, he, for, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we believe in them in the, in the correct manner and we negate in, in opposition to those names. Uh, yani we affirm for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in regards to his names and attributes, what he affirms for himself. And we negate uh, in regards to attributes and uh, th that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger negate. And we'll, we'll get further into uh, Asma al sifat as we move further into the poem because it's, it's a larger topic. But uh, this is just in general. What is the meaning of yanthani? Yanthani, yani intana yanthani, to return or to, to deviate off of something or to leave, yani in sarafa an shay or radda ba'dhu ala ba'd. So, it, yani this aqidah, he doesn't turn away from it. He doesn't, he, once, he, once we believe in it, once we have affirmed that this is our aqidah, then we do not turn away from it. We do not, we will not leave it for another opinion or another aqidah. We will not prefer over it anything. I'm sabit upon this. I'm firm upon this aqidah. And I don't seek to put something, or I don't, I'm not looking for something else better than it. Or I'm not seeking to put something else in this position. Are madhab and tawheed the same? Uh, no, no. Well, uh, here, when the, the author, rahimahullah, when he's saying madhab, He's referring to his manhaj, yani, the way in which he derives and deducts um, evidence in regards to al-aqidah. And tawheed is a portion, the greatest and the most honorable portion of al-aqidah. It's a subject or topic matter under the umbrella of al-aqidah, which specifically refers to the um, isolating worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yani, worshiping Allah alone. alaykum. Sir, can you please introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Yusha uh, Abu Zakaria. <laughs> I'm a student in the Islamic University of Medina. I'm studying in the College of uh, Usul uh, Dawa Usuluddin. I'm in my sixth uh, semester. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's with him, a brief introduction, I guess. Assalamualaikum. <laughs> Some deviants say restricting Tawheed to three types is not correct. And the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, did not divide Tawheed into three. So is it wrong to divide Tawheed into three? We will get into that later, inshallah. We will we'll hold off that question for another time. Ahsanallahu alaykum. Uh, do we have to memorize the wordings Ustav Yusha, hafizullah ta'ala, is using? Or can we use a copy we have on our own? Uh, I get. I guess what's best if we're checking the if um, the, the if we're checking the hip, then to stick to the the nuskha or the copy that we have provided for uh, we have provided you guys. With. Sure. Really, the changes are aren't many. Maybe instead of qadrun uh, ala wa fadailun sati'un. Uh, one or two words might, might change, but in general, the poem is the same. It shouldn't harm anyone. What are the topics included in Aqidah other than Tawheed? From amongst the topics of Al Aqidah are, as we said, um, the Arkan al Iman. So you have uh, Iman Billah, and that covers Tawheed. Uh, you have Malaika, the angels, the, um, the Kutub, the books, the Rusul, the messengers. Uh, and that includes from death onwards, from death, uh, life in the grave, uh, our resurrection, what happens on the day of resurrection, what do we see, what do we, um, what do we experience, Jannah, now, how do we believe in them, Qadr, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are we forced to do things, or do, are we independent of Allah, how do we appropriately, how do we uh, appropriately believe in that, uh, in general, it's, it covers all of the affairs of the ghaib in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to his messenger. 
Assalamualaikum. When the writer speaks about his madhab in the poem, then how does it differ from the aqidah of the four famous imam, of four famous madhahib? Is it different? No, it doesn't. It doesn't differ. And we'll touch upon that towards the end of the poem, as he mentions uh, the four imams. And um, it's important to note, to note that when an aqidah is attributed to someone from Ahlul Sunnah, then it's just referring to that person believing in this set aqidah. So the four uh, aimma, the, the four imams, don't have a separate aqidah. They have the same aqidah as um, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. But their madhahib or their madhab al-fiqhi or fiqhiya, their, the way in which they approach the ahkam or the rulings, Islamic rulings, differed. But their aqidah is one. Assalamualaikum. Uh, do we have to know Arabic for these lessons? It would be nice if someone was learning Arabic, but it's not a it's not a a, a, a condition to attend this lesson. I would try to, uh, I guess. I mean, it's an Arabic text, so it's kind of hard to not uh, speak with some type of Arabic. But I'll do my best to translate as much as possible. I'll be more aware of that, inshallah, if that was a problem. Assalamualaikum. Inshallah, we'll have the translation. We'll have this document with the translation as well. So whoever follow, they can yeah, benefit directly. Taib, as for the word muhaqqiq in the poem, how can we clarify to the people that it is not a tazkiyah of Shaykh al-Islam to himself? Assalamualaikum. There are many examples in the Quran. And from them, we brought the example of Yusuf. When he said, اِجْعَلْنِي عَلَىٰ خَزَائِنِ الْأَرْضِ إِنِّي حَفِيظٌ عَلِيمٌ is, is, and the example of, um, is not from the Quran, but rather from Ibn Mas'ud, in which he said, I don't, if, if I knew someone other than myself that was more knowledgeable in the Quran or that knew something that, that I didn't know in regards to the Quran, I would go to them and I would seek them out and I would ask them for that information. That the, the origin is that when it comes to Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, or people that, we, that we, we assume from them, from what we have seen from them, good and uh, a correct uh, behavior and correct mannerisms in line with the Prophet alayhi salatu then there's a reason behind them saying something like this. The statement isn't just to boast or brag. Rather, the statement is to let someone know. It's like saying right now, if you ask me who I am and I give you my accolades, I say I'm Dr. So-and-so and I've studied in this jamia and I studied in this university and I have this shahada, I have this um, um, uh, certificate and I studied under this scholar and this scholar, and I've gone this place and I've gone this place. It's to let you know and to give you a surety that you are talking with someone in, in regards to this field or reg in regards to this topic, someone that is well, well acquainted with it. What is the process of memorizing? Do, yani, do you have any tips in terms of memorization? Um... It, it depends on your, the uh, person's ability. But if you take three per week, then you can take, if you want, you, could, you can split it up into six, uh, six portions because each line is divided into two um, portions. So you can take one portion for each day. So, you can repeat that. It should be no less than 100 times. Um, you can repeat it as you're walking places, as you're sitting in your free time waiting, instead of going on the phone or checking something. Uh, you can sit there and repeat it, but you should try to repeat. It. Either you do half a line or a full line, try to repeat it no less than 100 times. Um, yeah, no less than 100 times. In the beginning, you can read, and then as you, as you feel more comfortable around 20 or around the 50th time, try repeating it uh, without looking at the paper. And, and go on until you feel comfortable enough to read the, the line without, um, without any hesitation. And Allah knows best, I don't know. Maybe the Shaykh uh, Abdul Salam has tips on memorizing. Jazakumullah khaira. We'll suffice with this, inshallah ta'ala. We'll see everyone next week. May Allah accept these efforts and make it a proof for everyone, especially on our Ustav, Muazin um, Hasanat, and on his scale of good deeds. I mean. Um, نكتفي بهذا القدر سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله